Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Yeah, I, I'm not making uh, CPAC this year. It's, it's down in Orlando, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. I, I don't think I'd be particularly welcome. So, uh, CPAC continues to be the Star Wars bar scene of the Republic. And, oh, yeah, there it is, yeah. Yeah, the theme music from... That seems old, though, because now it's become just this weird cult. I mean, it's... I, I said this morning I was on uh, Steph, with Stephanie Rule and I, I used I, I recycled the, the the quote about you know a clown with a flamethrower, you know a clown with a flamethrower still has a flamethrower. I mean it's it's you do go back and forth between going this is just ridiculous this is a clown car you know they are worshiping the golden idol of Donald Trump but um, th- these people are also dangerous and 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 we have seen that so apparently the theme is just going to be. It's going to be, yes, uh, Donald Trump uh, won the election. It was stolen. So a lot of the big lie. Um, You're all victims of cancel culture. And Donald Trump is still the orange God King. Right. Plus, there'll probably be a bunch of a bunch of um, uh, forums on Hillary's emails. It'll be kind of like that. Uh, Our guest today is the National Journal's Josh Kraschauer, who has watched all of this. Josh, did you ever go down to CPAC? Did you ever Ever hang out oh, there? Yeah, I mean, every political journalist in Washington, you know, the, it's all, it's always been held in the past at the National Harbor, right, right down the the Beltway from D.C. So, yeah, it was sort of an annual jaunt in March to to go and see what the conservative activist class was was talking about. And look, it, you know, it, it's funny, Charlie, because you know, I, I always thought the CPAC event was emblematic of the base of, of the party, but it certainly wasn't representative of the party at large. You right. remember, you know, all those straw polls where Rand Paul would win every year. Right. I mean, it was it was never it was a, it was an activist slice of the party. It was a good opportunity to get the flavor of where the conservative movement was headed. But um, the big question this year, Charlie, is, is it more representative of, of the party? Is, is the fact that, you know, the, 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 it's become a, 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 a super Trump fan convention? Um, is that where the Republican Party is right now? Maybe it is more representative of, of where the Republican Party is and, as opposed to the past. Well, that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, I, 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 I was only at one CPAC back in 2016 when it was still very anti-Trumpy. And it, it, it does have that sort of, you know, the Star Wars cantina vibe to it. But what was interesting is that you had a lot of people who were, they were ideologues. I mean, if they were cranks, they were crank ideologues with, everybody had a, you know, pamphlet about the flat tax or a pamphlet about, you know, the value added tax or something. And there were guys wearing capes who were part of some right wing Catholic organization that, wanted to have you know people sign up for some anti-gay marriage thing and all i mean it, but but these were people who had like some idea there and that's like they're just totally blown off i mean it's completely blown it's 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 all trump it's all the time and, and you see that uh, that if you know it's all cancel culture so that is different so maybe you're right about this i mean then that, that's that seems to be what the what the republican party has been did you see the, by the way the picture of the golden statue of donald trump they will uh wheeling down the hall i thought that was yeah the gold the golden calf if you will uh from from, from young pharaoh who i hadn't heard of but an anti-semitic uh invitee who ended up getting canceled from from the event to the golden trump <laughs> that was you know symbolic i think of, of where the trump movement is right now uh in, in almost too on trump. brand i mean seriously it's the golden idol. You're going to worship it. I mean, guys, come on. You know, did did you see how that movie ended? By the way, did you ever watch that? You know? I, I, yeah, I'm familiar with the the biblical story, and it doesn't end well for um, those who idolized, uh, you know, not idolize what's not holy, and that's what I mean. Look, we've talked about this so much on the show, Charlie, but you know, the Republican Party is right now something of a cult of personality, and even the most sort of uh, right-wing elements of CPAC in the past that were ripe for criticism or mockery. Th- 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 it was ultimately about policy. It was ultimately about issues. Uh, Mitt Romney, you know, it wasn't that long ago where Mitt Romney was cheered after he dropped out of the presidential race in, in 2008. That was 12 years ago. But, uh, you know, that that was, uh, it seems like ages ago. It seems like a generation ago. Um, and, you know, so the right now, you know, you saw the evolution in the Trump years of how CPAC had changed, but now this is the full culmination of that cult of personality no it certainly is um and this of course comes the morning after we have uh 
Mitch McConnell in this bizarre interview. I, I, I've watched this. I watched this tape over and over and over again. And, you know, he's 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 sweating a lot, maybe because he knows this was coming. <laughs> but this is the this is the exchange um, with uh, with with Brett Baer yesterday. This is this is Mitch McConnell. Well, there's a lot to happen between now and 24. I've got at least four members that I think are planning on running for president, plus some fo some uh, governors and others. There's no incumbent. Should be a wide open race and fun for you all to cover. If the president was the party's nominee, would you support him? Uh, the nominee of the party? Absolutely. Oh, good. Okay, 12 days ago, John, 12 days ago. He gave a speech denouncing the president. His lie had led to the insurrection. He he voted he voted against uh, you know removing him, uh, impeaching him. But um, he said he was he was morally responsible for all of that. And he, so he's asked about that, and he goes, "Well, look, my point is, what happened in the past is not something that's relevant now." I mean, the, just the pure nihilism. <laughs> Is kind of breathtaking, isn't it? I mean, I, I wrote in my newsletter that, you know, I'm tempted to say the Republican Civil War ended with that, not with a bang, but with a whimper. But seriously, even a whimper puts up more of a fight than that. Well, are you surprised, Charlie? Because, I mean, look, Mitch McConnell's playbook has been pretty transparent all along. And I think a lot of people look and I, and I when you think about Mitch McConnell, he's doing everything I don't think it's nihilistic. He's doing what, what he can to keep his party together, to, to, to not engage in a, in a civil war, to kind of keep the coalitions from the establishment side to the Trumpian side all in the same umbrella. And while Kevin McCarthy is doing that more openly, McConnell is playing sort of the, the, the behind the scenes tactician. And um, the second he voted to acquit, but then gave that, that, that floor speech condemning Trump's behavior, it was crystal clear that he was trying to keep both sides of this. He was trying to offer something to both sides of the Republican Party coalition. Now, I talked I talk to a lot of McConnell folks pretty regularly. And, you know, what, I, what I've gotten pretty early on is that, look, McConnell cares about winning above all else. He, he, he knows that if 75 percent of Republicans and all the recent polls, Charlie, show that, you know, you know, basically, if you're a Republican primary voter, Supporting Donald Trump is a requirement for office. You, yeah. you can't, you can't, you can't win a primary if you have any doubts or, 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 or harsh criticisms towards the former president. So what McConnell's basically doing is he's trying to lay low. He's trying not to aggravate, um, you know, both sides of the party. But he can't have, you know, he can't, he can't, you know, the Republican Party doesn't survive as an anti-Trump vehicle. So he's trying to, you know be as uh, muted as possible. And, and, you know, he hasn't talked to Trump since December. He, he, it's not like there's a relationship there, but he knows that for the party to survive as a whole, it, it, you can't, you can't throw Trump under the bus when 75% of the Republicans want him to be a central part of the party. This has always been a demand side problem. It's not a supply. Mitch McConnell right. has no warm feelings towards Donald Trump. This is the fact that the Republican party has become oh, after four years of president Trump, a cult of personality behind the former president. Okay, so here, here's here's the, the flip side of this because I I think this is a it, it's either naive or idiotic coming from a, a really smart guy like Mitch McConnell, because you, with, with Trump you're either all in or all out. This whole thing of you know trying to have it both ways, you're just going to get, you know, it's 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 like it's like the dead raccoon in the middle of the road. You, you're you're going to get hit from from both sides on all of this. So that's why I said nihilistic, which is that. You know, you, you take this stand. It looks like you're drawing a line of principle. You're saying that this guy, you know, has committed these terrible acts. He's a liar. Uh, he tried to subvert democracy. And yet uh, you would support giving him power again. I mean, that's the the complete lack of principle of 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 the guy. Um, and also, I, I it, it's that ongoing surrender. Now, you also point that he's you said that he's trying to you know, keep the Republican. You know, it's going to have the Republican Party survive. You look at these polls right now, uh, Donald Trump may be dominant in the Republican Party, but the stronger he gets, the more marginalized the party gets. And you, you can push back on me on this, but I'm looking at numbers showing that Trump's approval right now is in the in the 30s. And if you keep going in this direction, you may have a Trumpian party, but it's not necessarily going to be a successful party. And you would think that Mitch McConnell who wants to win Senate seats gets that. Yeah, the Republican Party cannot be like a cult of personality around Trump to win elections in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, sure. your home state of Wisconsin, all yeah. the states that you need to win the Senate back. He knows yeah. that. 
But they're, they're sort of the, the middle road now, Charlie, is you can respect Trump and, and, and pay homage to him without, you know, engaging in his most crazy conspiratorial theories. And that that so like, for example, Charlie, I, I asked how, like, how do you respect this guy? You, I mean, look. I've lost respect for how politics. <laughs> I mean, that, we're long past that that okay. that road, and I've I've become so jaded over yeah, these last I'm four not. years that it's everything's relevant. Look, look, another I'm good right. example. Another good example, Charlie, is you know Ben Sass kept his mouth shut um, in the run up to his reelection because he knew that if he spoke out against Trump, he'd he'd lose uh, the, the the primary. I mean, McConnell is essentially playing with a weak hand the long game. He's basically saying maybe, you know, we'll wait another year. Maybe some of these passions will cool. I don't think so, um, not, not based on what I've seen this last two months. But buy some time. Hope that you get these Republicans who are pro-Trump but not talking about election fraud, not talking about, you know, the most radical, the marginal, the, the MTG type, type, type stuff. And they can just respect Trump but talk about the issues they want to talk I, about. I, 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 and that, that, that's the thinking. I don't know if it's going to work. But that's the political framework. Uh, yeah, that that attempt to split the baby, I think, is going to end in tears. What the, what is interesting, though, and, and and you're certainly right when you say that you know the Republican base is you know demands support for for Trump. And again, this is an irony that others have pointed out, but I think it's worth underlining. This whole um, you know CPAC theme of America uncancelled and the worst thing in the world is cancel culture. There is nobody that has a more active cancel culture right now than the Republican Party. If you criticize Trump, if you break with Trump. If you refuse to bow your knee to Trump, you are canceled. You look at Adam Kinzinger. You look what's happening to any of the Republicans that bucked Trump, the, the censure resolutions, of uh, the primering of them. I mean, literally, they are trying to cancel any conservative who opposes Trump. And it's like you look at the roster there. There's there's no diversity of opinion of conservatives. There, there's not going to be a debate about ideas. You know, if if you did not support Donald Trump, you have been canceled from CPAC. So I don't know. This is the problem with uh, with this sort of hypocrisy. Can I just say one thing before we, we get into other things? But I want to talk about school closures and about the, the big COVID relief bill that's going to pass the House of, of Representatives today. Speaking of being canceled, Liz Cheney, um, I, I'm, I'm, I continue to be fascinated both by her position and the reaction to her. So, And I mentioned this on the podcast with Tim Miller yesterday. She's speaking to the Reagan Institute. And she's she's not backing down on anything. And she's talking about January 6th. And she said, it's very important, especially for us as Republicans, to make clear that we are not the party of white supremacy. And then she talks about the riot. And she says, you certainly saw anti-Semitism. You saw the symbols of Holocaust denial. You saw a Confederate flag being carried through the rotunda. We as Republicans in particular have a duty and an obligation to stand against that, to stand against insurrection. Okay. So apparently the folks over at The Federalist are very upset by this. Dave Marcus, right? I mean, he, there was umbrage, a lot of umbrage, a lot of high dudgeon. Dave Marcus writes this, this, this piece where he says, I feels personally insulted. You called me a white supremacist, he writes. You called tens of millions of Trump voters white supremacists. Your lies about us will not go unchallenged. Okay, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Because, but this is the... This is the lazy um, victim card playing that we're seeing on the right, that if anybody calls out racism or anti-Semitism, the pushback is not, hey, you're right, we need to isolate the racist. The pushback is, well, you're calling all of us racist. This is the point that I think really needs to be made. And I try to make it in my newsletter this, this morning, which if you subscribe to Bulwark Plus, you got, is that Liz Cheney actually didn't say anything different than other Republican leaders said over and over and over again, including Ronald Reagan. And this is a flashback. This is Ronald Reagan speaking at the NAACP convention in 1981. Let's play that. A few isolated groups in the backwater of American life still hold perverted notions of what America is all about. Recently, in some places in the nation, there's been a disturbing reoccurrence of bigotry and violence. If I may, from the platform of this organization, known for its tolerance, I would like to address a few remarks to those groups who still adhere to senseless racism and religious prejudice. To those individuals who persist in such hateful behavior, if I were speaking to them instead of to you, I would say to them, you are the ones who are out of step with our society 
You are the ones who willfully violate the meaning of the dream that is America. And this country, because it's what it stands for, will not stand for your conduct. My administration will vigorously investigate and prosecute those who, by violation of or violence or intimidation, would attempt to deny Americans their constitutional rights. So, Josh, I, I wonder if, if somebody said that from the podium of CPAC, whether they'd be booed today. I mean, it really says a lot that Liz Cheney says the same thing now, and it's heresy. OK, but one more clip here. Bob Dole. Uh, felt the need to say the same thing. And this is his nominating speech, the his speech accepting the Republican presidential nomination in 1996. Bob Dole. But if there's anyone who has mistakenly attached himself to our party in the belief that we are not open to citizens of every race and religion, then let me remind you, tonight this hall belongs to the party of Lincoln, and the exits which are clearly marked are for you to walk out of as I stand this ground without compromise. Wow. So Liz Cheney is, is just basically saying, hey, guys, every once in a while, a party needs to have some ideological hygiene, right? I mean, it's a process of hygiene and get rid of the nuts, the bigots, the cranks and everything. And yet she is the one on the out. She is the one who has been canceled. I, I, it's hard to imagine somebody saying in Republican circles saying what Ronald Reagan said back in 1981, Josh Kraschauer. Yeah, that, that Liz Cheney uh, quote it, at, with, with Kevin McCarthy standing right in front of her oh, that was says good. it all. And good for her. Good for her standing up for her principles. The Republicans could use a little more of that bravery, like political courage. Uh, the reality, Charlie, is that we're in such a period of tribal solidarity. You know, any, any you can't. I mean, you, you're right that there is a cancel culture on the right that if you say anything even mildly critical of Donald Trump and the Republican Party, you will be punished. You will be censured by your local or state party. And Pat Toomey, who was a, once a Republican insurgent who ra rallied against the establishment wing of the party, is now being censured by his own state party for not being pro-Trump enough, even though he, he did have a pretty, pretty pro-Trump voting record during his time in the Senate. One of the most fascinating things about Liz Cheney, and, and, it, and it's not just, I mean, we've talked about this on the show, there, there's a liberalism all over, there's tribalism all over, this is a bipartisan dynamic, but the thing that's fascinating to me about the whole Liz Cheney situation is that there have been a number of national polls that have come out and asked both Republicans and Democrats what they think of Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney has glowing numbers among Democrats. She is like Barack Obama type numbers among, among Democrats in two recent polls that came out. And among Republicans, she's persona non grata just because she voted to impeach President Trump. I mean, if that doesn't tell you that our politics is all about Trump, it's all about part. It's a, I mean, this is the, this is someone who's still a conservative, still a hawk, still someone who is the daughter of Dick Cheney, who's driven the, the left crazy over the years, and yet she is viewed glowingly among Democrats, and, and she's a, an enemy of the state among most Republican voters. That is how sick our politics is, the fact that we can't judge people based on the substance of what they believe in. It's all about whether you're loyal or disloyal to, to the former president. That's absolutely true. There's no question about it. Did, uh, we have a soundbite, by the way, of Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff who was on Fox and uh, uh, you know, talking about how how completely Trumpified the Republican Party is going to be. And the thing about it is there's just no subtlety. Do we have that cut from Mark Meadows? But what we will see on Sunday is we will see the, the start of, of planning for the next uh, administration. And I can tell you, uh, the people that are at the top of that list, all of them have Trump as their last name. OK, before we get into what's going on right now, because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of talking about Trump a little bit, I want to talk about what's going on with the Biden administration. Uh, but just a little maybe this is a mini commercial for my for our newsletter and Bulwark Plus. Um, the, the, the newsletter today is, yes, the you know GOP does have a racism problem. And it talks about Liz Cheney's comments and the blowback from the Federalist and the, the speech that Ronald Reagan gave, et cetera. But also um, I, I focus on a piece that appears in this uh, uber Trumpy publication called American Greatness that is as overtly racist as you're going to find anywhere. I mean, it's not, there's no subtlety. There's no gray lines here. It's, Christian Vanderbrook calls it Nazi shit. And it's a guy who talks about being in New York City with all of these lowlifes and these specimens and 
um, talks about how uh, he refuses to humanize them. He says, I refuse to humanize those who cannot be bothered to lift a finger to humanize themselves. The, uh, the mentally ill need our care. The rest need the whip. I mean, he refers to them as, you know, fat, lazy, leeches, slugs, thugs. It, it is it is so over the top. It makes you wonder, how did, how did something like this appear? And, and my point is this. Look, I mean, it would be alarming, but not shocking if this was in some neo-Nazi publication or some alt-right publication. But it's in a publication that is really squarely within Trump world. I mean, the people who write for this publication, I mean, and you can make up your own mind whether you think, I mean, this, and this, by the way, is not the first time that American Greatness has published something that is, and, and I just don't think that there's a gray line here. I mean, the gray, there's going to be grays here, you know, white nationalist, pure, we hate these people, they are insects, um, etc. Et this is a publication that features people like Victor Davis Hanson, Roger Kimball, Selena Zito, Josh Hammer, who's Newsweek's opinion editor. Uh, Dennis Prager writes for all of this. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that these guys are all white nationalists. I'm saying that they're comfortable in being in the presence of them. So this yeah, is the, this, seen, that's the question, you know. I haven't seen the public. The public, I mean, I very, very, very rarely read the, the publication. Yeah. But um, if it is what you say it is, that's that's pretty awful. And it it, res, it speaks to a, a movement that doesn't, uh, pol you know, police itself. It, this is what yeah. happens when institutions, I mean, Trump is the biggest factor, I think, in that he's sort of, encouraged and anything goes and, and encourages some of the worst behavior on the right to to, to thrive but look i mean the, the the story of trump's success in the republican party uh within the republican party movement is that there have been no guardrails there have been no leaders that speak up um speak truth to power if you will there's been no institutional um you know guardrails and we've seen this all along and that doesn't just apply to the party it applies to, to publications institutions within the party and it, you know it's gotten worse and worse i think as the time goes gone on it, it it does okay so it is friday and cpac's down in cpac but back in washington dc the house of representatives is about to pass a 1.9 trillion dollar covid relief package it appears that there are no republicans as in absolutely zero republicans who are going to be voting in favor of that is that uh, is that your take josh yeah, I think it's a pretty safe bet that you're not going to get a single Republican senator to vote for the. the no, Senate. even even congressman. I, I mean, it looks like it's. I mean, it, it looks like it's going to be like 2009 all over again. Yeah, I mean, I, I would. I'm, I'm more confident the Senate is going to yeah. be united. There may be one or two House Republicans that could end up defecting. But yeah, I mean, this is uh, now. I mean, this is the big question: Who do you blame? Who, who's responsible for? the first month of uh, the Biden administration becoming a lot more partisan than it had to be. Um, and I, you know, I've written about this pretty extensively. I, I think it was a, it could be end up looking like a major political blunder for Biden not to at least try to come up with a halfway point or, you know, a compromise that would be on his terms, you know, instead of 1.9 trillion, you know, getting a, a couple of Republicans to defect in support of a 1.4 or 1.5, you know, get cutting back some of the, the well, spending they, that's geared towards. They must, have, they must have tried. So why did it not happen? I mean, I, I think your point is, is, is right on. You would th think that, look, there's, there's with $1.9 trillion, there's going to be some extras in there. There's going to be some bonuses in there. There are some things where the, the spending is back, really backloaded that is not focused on COVID. Um, maybe some of the state and local government aids might not be necessary. So why w was there no compromise at all? What, what, what happened? I mean, well, I mean, the thinking in the Biden White House is, comes down to this, that they wanted to get this passed yeah. as soon as possible. They think that it's politically beneficial, that it's going to juice up the economy in, in the run up to the, the midterm elections. And they, they just didn't think that it was worth getting. They didn't think they could get 10 Republican senators to get to that filibuster proof majority. So they didn't think it was worth getting the Mitt Romneys or the Lisa Murkowskis and the Susan Collinses on board only to see that effort fail and have to go through the regular or through the, you know, the reconciliation route. I, I, you know, I think when you're ever, when you're a president who ran almost predominantly on unity, bipartisanship, you make an inauguration speech about bringing both sides together. I think even making a significant gesture and trying to find some common ground, even if it doesn't work out, even if even if it doesn't, you know, ultimately in the end come to fruition, would have paid significant political dividends. I think the political risk for Biden now, and we saw what happened with Obama when he when he went the partisan route in, in 2009, 2010, uh, you're, you're, you own the economy. You own all the, the good and the bad that, that comes down the pike. And there are a lot of uh, certainly Republicans, but there's some prominent uh Democratic economists from 
uh, Larry Summers and uh, 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 the, the former auto czar uh, Ratner, um, Steve Ratner, who have warned that this could overheat the economy. And if you look in the long term in the midterm elections, the 2024 elections, this is the Biden economy now. He, he's owning the economy. It doesn't really matter how well these individual provisions poll. What Biden's going to be judged by is, is the state of the economy in two years. So, you know, it's a risk. I, I think it undermines a appealing a part of his message that allowed him to win so many moderate voters, so many anti-Trump Republican voters. But, you know, that's what they decided. They wanted to get this done fast. They wanted to do it on a partisan basis. So let me I, I don't disagree with anything you said, but but let me, the flip side is that, yes, he ran on being bipartisan, but he also ran on getting shit done. And ultimately, uh, his, his presidency is going to be judged on whether or not he gets a handle on the coronavirus pandemic and brings back the economy. Everything else is kind of a little bit window dressing that, you know, we may con be concerned about compromise and bipartisanship, but uh, we and the other 4% of America that cares about process over actual substance. The polls that I have seen, and you tell me if I'm wrong about this, the polls that I've seen would suggest that he has big majorities in favor of this package. And as we know, sending out money is popular. Uh, most of the elements of this um, have big majorities on their side. So the politics certainly would favor getting this done quickly, getting money into people's pockets and taking the risk on the economy. But the Republicans are also taking a risk that they will have look ob obstructionist and not part of what could be a rather significant economic comeback. Yeah, well, number one, I don't think people are going to be voting in the next year's midterm elections on the minimum wage or on a stimulus check from over a year ago. It's going to be on whether they feel the economy is back, right. whether people are, you know, whether things are getting back to normal. Now, I think the Biden administration bet is that everything's on track, even without a stimulus, I think we'd be headed in a pretty good direction. But this is only going to move things forward. It's only going to accelerate that process. So they feel very confident um, by betting on the economy, by betting that this can be attributed to a, a growing economy in 2022. So that, that that's the political thinking in, in, in Biden world. I, I think the, the, the historical record will show that Biden really didn't try to reach out to folks like Mitt Romney and Susan Collins. Like, I think that that I, there was a lot of spin about the Obama first year in office. But, I, you know, having covered the, the first month of the Biden White House, you know, the Democrats did not want to waste time working with the more moderate Republicans, the anti-Trump Republicans. And, and that's a cost that they're going to have to pay if things don't go well. They, they can't rewrite history. They're not going to be able to revisit what actually happened from their own decision making. I mean, if you can't win Mitt Romney and Adam Kinzinger and Susan Collins, uh, that, that's, that, that's, uh, that's on you. I mean, that's, your, that, that, that's a decision that you made by not trying to appeal well, to the more fiscally moderate anti-Trump Republicans that really would be willing to, 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 to reach across partisan lines. Well, except that I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding that simply because somebody is an anti-Trump Republican does not mean that they are a moderate Republican. Um, people like Adam Kinzinger and, and Mitt Romney are actually quite fiscally conservative, aren't they? So I you know, it, you know, it does. Yeah, but those were the winning votes for Biden. Those, those were the winning votes for Biden to, that put him over the top in the election. So you would think you want to keep your coalition together, you know, to to, to improve the Democratic Party's prospects and what might be a tough midterm election. Instead, he's he's saying, well, that faction, we don't need them anymore. And, and yeah. look, maybe that's a smart play, but we'll see how the economy goes. We'll see how he handles the rest of his, uh, you know, his, his policy agenda. I, I think Susan Collins was probably reachable. Um, you would think, though, that with with Biden's skills, you would sit down and you you kind of, you know, do a little bit of horse trading, particularly on infrastructure and things like that. That uh, that would that would be that would be attractive, and and I think that Romney, to, to your point though, that Romney has shown himself to be uh, rather flexible on some issues. Um, his position on the child credit, uh, I think, shows his willingness to engage on public policy and to come halfway. Uh, even his position on on the minimum wage, he's not just saying absolutely no. He's saying, okay, can we talk about ten dollars versus fifteen dollars uh, an hour? And apparently, that's not. That is that's not taking place. This is all very dangerous. And I, I, can I just throw a, a, a sort of a paranoid thought from from the point of view of the of the Democrats? Because I'm, I'm remembering the reaction that I got last summer when I mentioned, hey, you know, Donald Trump actually could run for president in 2024. And people thought, no, you're crazy. No, that's nuts. Will it actually happen when, when you have a 50 50 Senate? You have one guy who gets hit by a bus and it's over. <laughs> You know, um, there was that moment. Do you remember when um, 
uh, Pat Leahy was taken to the hospital a couple of months ago. And yeah, oh, yeah. People, and people yeah. went, okay, do you understand that one guy, if he's not there for the vote, you don't have the votes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that remember the month after the election when De- you know Democrats lost 12 House seats and, and, and only had 48 Senate seats at the time and they – were wondering what, what what happened and they were trying to do an, an autopsy of their own political yeah. situation. And that quickly disappeared after Democrats won the two Senate seats in Georgia. The reality, though, didn't really change a whole lot. Right. I mean, that, that, that you have 50 Senate seats and you, and you have a very narrow House majority. You need you need to like work with the Congress you have, not the Congress you want. Right. And, you know, look, I, I think there's an argument politically that if the Republicans are so badly divided and they're, they're just obstructing uh, no matter what, then you look at the map in 2022, you look at um, the ability to run on a growing economy. Why not play the long game? Why not you know, try to work small and go big and get those extra two or three Senate seats in two years so you can do the bigger things that progressives want or that, 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 that are more uh, sustainable with, with a 52-seat Senate majority? But it sounds like there – I mean, the, as I wrote in my recent column, you know, actions speak louder than spin. And it almost seems like despite all the Republican Party's problems, they're worried that they, that they – they're, they're trying to go so big that they're almost guaranteeing Republicans unify together and have a better midterm election than, than, than otherwise would, would, would be expected. So you know, there, there's a lot of political decision-making going on. I think one, one way of looking at things is you want to build back better. You want to you know, have, a, have a better than expected midterm and exploit those Republican divisions. The way they're acting, at least you know, in the first month, is that they're trying to get as much done with a 50 seat Senate in two years, even if it means giving, you know, even if it means conceding Democrats may lose one of the one of the two chambers in two years. Yeah. But I again, I, I think that betting on going big early, getting it done, having the economy surge back, um, it's it, it, it's a it's a calculated risk, but it, it doesn't strike me as irrational. And also, it, it does seem relevant that uh, Biden's approval ratings uh, seem to be pretty steady and much more impressive than anything that Donald Trump has. And again, I keep coming back to this, and the, these, the, the numbers would suggest that you get outside of Washington and what he's doing has more support than, than it would say in the United States. So let's talk about, uh, uh, just briefly, let's talk about uh, the minimum wage issue. Uh, the, the Senate parliamentarian has ruled this is this is where you got to, you have to get wonky has, has has ruled that it would be out of order to include a minimum wage increase in the recon in the covid package because under the reconciliation rules anything that adds to the deficit can't be there is that right basically so the parliamentarian is saying you can't have the minimum wage in the package and at least the conventional wisdom is that is a massive blow it'll be put in the house package but it probably has to be taken out in the Senate. Is that right? That is right. And um, look, I, I think the minimum wage is, is not going to be part of the, the stimulus. It is going to be another legislative effort separately for the Biden administration. I think it's one that there, there could be an easy compromise. In fact, Romney and even Tom Cotton came out for some sort of pairing the minimum wage with 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 infor- immigration enforcement, I believe, for, for, for workers, for, for employers. So, I mean, there there is a, ability to reach some bipartisan agreement. Um, if, if it's not $15 an hour, if it's $11 an hour or something like that. I, I want to go back to one point you made, sure, Charlie, sure. I think it's a really important one. Um, you know, there's sort of two ways of thinking of the Republican Party, because you just noted that a lot of the the, the stimulus measures, the $1,400 check, the minimum wage, they actually pulled pretty well with Trump voters. So like maybe the Republican Party in that, in that thinking isn't as you know, hopeless as, as uh, maybe there is, I mean, that would suggest there is room for compromise that there right. isn't this ideological yeah. craziness that that's continuing. And then you see the, the you know, the fidelity to Trump in, in some of these same polls. I mean, I think the Biden white house needs to figure out which Republican party are you dealing with? If, if, if there is so much Republican receptivity and if they believe that the Republican party voters are more reasonable than they've said, then yeah, like maybe like they're playing their hand you know, maybe, maybe, maybe like that, that is a totally different version than what, what we've been been told or what we've been been expecting um, in, in recent months. But you've got to kind of, they got to figure out what Republican Party they're dealing with. Like, uh, is it a Republican Party that's going to have voters that want this stuff and, and then that this is politically popular? Or is it the kind of crazy Republican Party that's, you know, adhering to Trump at all costs? 
Yeah, and I think that I think that's a that's that's a good point. Okay, that one one other wonky question about the minimum wage. Um, so the the parliamentarians saying you cannot include that in. There are progressives in the Senate who are saying, well, we should appeal the ruling from the chair. That the way it works is, so the chair will rule. Okay, minimum wage is out of order. Uh, somebody says I appeal the ruling, and fifty plus one Democrats could overrule that ruling from the parliamentarian. Correct. So, I mean, they they in theory, they could keep that back in the package in, in theory. theory. Here, here's the, the problem. And this kind of goes back to the, the overall point. Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Sinema, the two most moderate Democrats, aren't going to support the, the, the 50. <laughs> they're going to they're, they don't want to um, they, they're not in agreement with the majority of their colleagues on the, the, the minimum wage and on the on, on the on the acceptability of putting it in, in as part of the stimulus. So, I mean, they're not Democrats don't have the votes no matter what. I think they're trying to save face, get it, getting the House to vote in support of what they view as a very popular minimum wage pike measure. But um, ultimately, this is political kabuki. The minimum wage fight is going to be done um, probably separately and, and under regular order where they're going to fi- have to find, you know, bipartisan coalitions, make deals, make some okay. compromises yeah. to, to, to reach out and, and build those build those majority support. I think you're I think you're right about that. OK, let's talk about the other major issue that's shadowing the Biden administration. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I think the picture. Well, I you've written about this. And so I wanted to get your perspective on it. Uh, Joe Biden ran promising that he would reopen schools within 100 days. Um, they're getting pushback. The administration is getting a lot of pushback, particularly from teachers unions that are resisting this. So um, Republicans have seized on this issue as a very, very potent wedge issue saying that we need to get the kids back in school. And and they're accusing the Biden administration of of, you know, knuckling under to the teachers union. So give me your sense of the power of that issue, how salient that issue is and how the Biden administration is handling it. Yeah. So, I mean, the issue of opening schools safely in a reasonable timetable is going to be very important, at least for the off year elections, uh, the governor's races in Virginia, maybe New Jersey and, and the possible recall election of Governor Gavin Newsom. In, in all, all, this, all this year, not next year. All so, this year. Yeah. So I, we, we had um, Dan Senna, one of, who I think is one of the smartest Democratic strategists. On, on my podcast, and I asked him about the schools issue, and he made a good point. He basically said that, look, right now, if the schools opened up in a, in a few weeks and everything was back to normal and we're getting – everyone feels good about where, where schools are, no one's going to remember this in, in, in 2022 and, and probably not even in the off-year election. But if you basically see this slow walk where you know the teachers' unions continue to put up obstacles into – opening up five days a week where we're, you know, by the fall of 2021, you still may see some school districts that don't have full, you know, in school learning. Um, if there's a new normal that they try to implement about how, how education is, is done, that that's a real possibility. And we're, we're almost at the point where the, you know, if we're getting, you know, into the spring and, and there's no real momentum for the vast majority of schools to, to be open in person, it's going to create a lot of scar tissue. I mean, people remember like, Incom- government incompetence and the inability to get things done. And, and furthermore, Biden made a promise of 100 days, a majority. Now, he said a majority of, of, of K-8 schools, I think it, the perception is going to be a lot higher than just a mere majority. I think, you know, people are going to have to feel like school is getting back to normal in 100 days um, that for it to be politically effective. So I, I think Democrats, if they get their act together, if they, if they can persuade the teachers unions to, you know, open schools up in, in, in a lot of key jurisdictions, it may be a forgotten issue, but I, you know, the more you look at this issue, the more um, kind of radical you see. The, the, you see this like real, real element of radicalism within certain elements of of the Democratic Party base with the teachers unions, and you see these kind of views that are just totally anathema to where parents are and in terms of keeping them closed or, or having such a high bar to, to getting schools back in session. And I think that will be a, that that view of you know, Democratic run states and cities not being able to have a, a modicum of competence in getting schools back. And it's going to be a big issue if they don't get their act together soon. It is going to be a big issue. Um, but but also here here's my question. The Biden administration does not have the power to reopen these schools. The Biden administration doesn't have the ability to, you know, uh, you know, helicopter into Fairfax, Virginia or Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and say, I, the president of the United States, order you to reopen. These are these are local decisions. And so he has a limited ability to make it happen, doesn't he? 
Yeah, he, he can't dictate to the school right. systems in, across the country you need to open. But unlike Trump, he has a, a key ally in the teachers unions that are, you know, he, you know, it's, it's a lot easier when you're you're the person who has a lot of influence on, on the major obstacle to getting these, these school systems open. And the fact that he's had to, his, you know, his messaging has been all over the place. I, I thought his message, at the, he did that town hall yeah. in your neck of the woods in Wisconsin, Charlie, and he actually said a pretty straight, direct a goal of getting the schools open in 100 days. And if that's the case, then he'll be fine. But when you hear messaging from Jen Psaki and from some of his, Ron Klain and some of the, the officials, when they're actually pressed on, on what the plan is to get schools open, what the rhetoric is to the teachers unions to get their act together, you don't see that same type of direct direct talk. And that's a problem. I mean, that, that's going to be a problem if they don't. Um, they, 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 Biden can't wave a magic wand to get the schools open. Well, he, he has the bully pulpit to really influence one of his key supporters, key groups that supported him to get their acts together. Well, what, what if, though, and I'm and I'm I haven't really thought this through. So just bear with me. Here. So but what if he said, OK, we absolutely have to get the schools open. And as a result of that, I am issuing an order that every teacher in America, um, every public school teacher in America gets gets a vaccine. Let's make this happen. Yeah, I mean, that the message was for a time past the it was almost like making the, the stimulus bill sort of a condition to get in the schools open. Right. Maybe that's the strategy, Charlie. Maybe they want to use this as sort of that they want to get this bill passed and get credit for getting the schools open because of the, of the funding for, for schools. But it's taking I mean, th- this bill won't pass till mid-March. I mean, that, that's already a few weeks out. And, you know, I, I just think we've already gotten past the, the point of parity in many cases where you have the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, saying a few weeks ago, like, it's safe to open the schools. And then, you know, I, I wish we got the kind of leaks from the Biden White House that we did in the Trump administration, because it's pretty clear that there was some political hands in, at the, at, you know, in the White House saying, hey, we got to walk this back. We got to get our stakeholders and the teachers unions and, and certain certain uh, folks who don't want the schools to open to put enough bureaucratic language to to walk that statement back. And I wish we got the kind of leaks that we did, you know, like, you know, that, that, that would have I think I think that might change the perception about what's going on behind the scenes. But look, yeah, clearly there was political engagement, political political involvement and teachers unions don't want the schools to open right away. And they they've won out in the in, in, in the short term. All right. So what else you we uh, what else are you keeping your eye on over the next week that we should uh, we should be paying attention to? Well, you know, I'm looking at a lot. We talked about McConnell at the top of the podcast. I mean, a lot of these Senate races are, are heating up with these primaries. Who's getting in the races? Who, who's not? Who's not getting in? Um, so you know, it, it is it is like an early test of how Trumpy the Repub- I mean, these are the battles of of, of how Trumpy the Republican Party. Uh, is going to be Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina. Um, so it, it is going to be an early, we're starting to see the recruiting process ramp up. We're seeing some candidates get in. We're seeing rhetoric starting to, you know, candidates trying to figure out how they want to, how to relate to Trump on the Republican side and how liberal they want to go on the Democratic side. So it, it is an early preview of where the battle lines are going to be drawn in the next two years. Is it too early to say that that as of right now, the only remotely anti-Trump Senate Republican candidate in 2022 is Lisa Murkowski, that everybody else is either going to be Trump or Trumpier. I, you know, it's weird because, again, like, I, I, like for example, one Republican that's likely to get into a Senate race is a uh, former Pennsylvania Congressman Ryan Costello and, 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 and from the used to be a representative around the Philadelphia suburbs. I, I think most people would consider him like pragmatic, you know, center right, the type of Republican that you probably would support, Charlie. But, you know, he's not criti- – I mean, and he's criticized Trump in the past as well. But I don't know if he's – he would identify in the – in the like the bulwark lane of the, of the Republican Party, right? I mean, I think I think even the more establishment-oriented candidates, uh, you know, are, 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 are not trying to alienate Trump and not trying to gratuitously tick him off. So, you know, you have someone like that who I think is a serious – gratuitously, gratuitously tip him off, just saying the truth about the guy. That's not right. gratuitous. <laughs> right. But I mean, for politi- if you're a Republican candidate and you're not going to win a primary if, if you're losing, if, you, if, that, if that's what the race becomes yeah. about. If you, so, if, you, if you come out against white supremacy and against chronic lying um, and, and against sedition, um, that, that probably is enough to get you canceled, though. Yeah, but that's not going to be the I mean, of <laughs> course, but those aren't the issues that are going to be talked about I know. in the Republican primary. So, you know, you have someone like or but then you have someone like Josh Mandel in Ohio, who is like I literally know. playing to the erogenous zones of every every Trump super fan, right? I mean, if you that's listen exactly right. to 
So, I mean, there is a degree of, you know, I don't think anyone's going to be in the, you know, Lisa, Murka Lisa Murkowski lane. She's the only uh, senator who voted for impeachment who's actually on the ballot in 2022. But you are going to see different shades of Trumpism within the Republican Yeah, Party. no, I think, I think you're obviously right. Josh Krashauer, it is a delight to have you back on the podcast. We appreciate it very much. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I will be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again.